Hey everybody, welcome to Word Horde Presents. I am Sean M. Thompson, and I am speaking today with Mr. John Langan. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks, Sean. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Can't complain. So, let's get right into it. Um, what do you feel about the term weird fiction, and do you consider yourself a weird author, or do you consider yourself... Well, what do you think of yourself as? Uh, I think of myself as uh, as a writer uh, who writes horror stories. Um, that was the term I guess I grew up with uh, when I was when I when I first really decided I wanted to be a writer when I was in high school. Um, it was from reading Stephen King and Peter Straub, and they described themselves at the time as horror writers. So that was the term that I uh, I guess I, I just kind of grew up with. Um, yeah, right. I, I know, um, you know, there's historical basis for using the term weird fiction. Uh, there's also historical basis for using the the, uh, the term horror fiction. Uh, Lovecraft uses both in his letters, for example. Um, so I think, um, uh, to me, it doesn't really matter what you call me as, as long as you're reading my stuff. Um, I, at times, I, I guess, I've, I've been a little bit impatient with some of my friends who've who've embraced the weird fiction label because I, I guess I, I'm not really clear how their fiction is weird as opposed to horror fiction. Um, and, and, you know, maybe this isn't fair on my part. Um, I've, I've sort of wondered if it isn't just a way to, to avoid having to tell people you write horror fiction because that tends to provoke such a, uh, a strong and negative reaction from people. Um, you say, oh, I'm a horror writer. It's happened to me, you know. Yeah. Um, and they look at you, they're, oh, my, because what they're thinking about is they're thinking about Saw or Hostel or right. The Human Centipede. And so they assume that, that that's what you're writing. And um, so I, I appreciate that if people are like, no, no, weird sounds a little bit better than, uh, than, than horror. Um, that's fine. I mean, I think there are a few writers, um, Michael Sisko, for example. Um, I think if you want to describe Michael Sisko as a weird writer, He's he seems to me uh, the the dictionary definition of a of a weird writer just doing right, his yeah. own strange unclassifiable kind of thing. He's definitely playing in the the fantastic end of the pool, but he's just what he's doing is is so much its own thing that if if that's what you want to say uh, a, a weird writer is or, or if his fiction is weird fiction, then hey, that's cool. Um, well, would you consider I, uh, a weird writer then possibly a slipstream style of writer? Because you have people you know, like Kelly Link, who I would, I think, are probably classified as slipstream, but they're not classified as weird authors. Yeah, the funny thing is that some of Kelly's stuff is actually, I would say, is actually deeply weird. She has this story called The Stone Animals that I have read and reread since I first read it, um, and taught and retaught um, because I because it's so weird because I just don't. It's about a couple that moves into a haunted house, um, and. I mean, and she's pregnant, and the, their marriage is kind of rocky, and there are stone animals, stone little rabbits out front, but maybe they're real rabbits, and maybe those rabbits are being uh, ridden by tiny men with, I think, spears. And Okay, and, this does uh, sound like a weird story, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, um, I, you know, when I think about, like, Slipstream, for example, I tend to think about Slipstream as, as something that – hovers more between the fantastic and what we call the realistic um okay. so so that there's this slightly something is slightly strange uh something is so there's some kind of genre element uh, like a lot of karen russell stuff i i think probably falls more in that in that uh in that place where there's some kind of weird element but the weird element is is treated within a a pretty realistic and even um I don't want to say mundane because that sounds pejorative, but but I just right. mean a kind of matter of fact kind of context. Um, so Karen Russell has this great story called Vampires in the Lemon Grove, that's about these two old vampires who are living um, in this little lemon grove in this island off the coast of Italy, <laughs> because they've discovered that if they suck on these particular lemons, it sort of takes away their their thirst for human blood, and. Um, Gradually, what's happened is that the 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 woman in the couple uh, has uh, the, the lemons have stopped working for her, and oh, yeah. so it's about them, you know, sort of growing apart um, and uh, just wrestling with 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 what they are. Um, 
I still, to be honest, when I think about it, I still kind of think of it as a horror story. But yeah. if you want to uh, say, oh, but it's kind of slipstreamy, you know, a lot of stories, um, they they can fill a number of different or, or fit into a number of different slots, I guess, fill a number of different categories. So, okay. um, but yeah, Kelly does a lot of, I mean, she Kelly does a lot of stuff all across the board. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, honestly, a lot of her stuff I think of as horror fiction. A, a lot of her stuff I, I think of as um, um, as as this you know this kind of horror fiction where it's not only that there's a kind of horrific concept at work, but that the structure of the story, the things that she's doing with narrative structure, are kind of like destabilizing the the narrative experience for you as the reader, so that what you're getting is, um, you know, like like when you read Stephen King, for example. Yeah. Um, there's a pretty stable world that you can assume and a kind of a stable narrative experience that you're going to have. And right, even if there's outlandish things, it's, it's grounded in realism. Yeah, and I think with Kelly, what you're getting a, a lot of times is that the narrative itself starts to, to kind of twist underneath you and the sort of solid footing that you thought you had, suddenly you're like, wait, wait, where's my solid footing? <laughs> so I guess that leads me into my next question. What do you feel the role of genre is in fiction in general? Do you feel that it's an important uh, distinction to make if you read a story to be able to classify it, or is it more of a marketing tool? Um, yes. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think um, for me as a, as a reader, for example, yeah. um, I always liked knowing, you know, I, I liked certain kinds of stories. And so I, I, I like to be, to be able to go into the bookstore and find those kinds of stories. Well, right. Otherwise, it would just be a big stack and go, all right, have fun. Yeah, and I know that there are people who, who say, um, yes, that's the way it should be. It should just all be fiction. That's insane. Um, <laughs> you would never find anything. Well, I think that's part of it, right, is, is that, yes, it's true that you might stumble across things you wouldn't otherwise stumble across. Um, but I also think, yeah, you would spend a lot of time just, just – trying to find things. So I don't see anything wrong in that way as, as, a, as a kind of shorthand to help you find what you're looking for as a reader. Um, as, from a writing standpoint or maybe like a, like a literary critical standpoint, I, I think genre is, it's inescapable. You know, like, like, like genre is kind. It's, it's things that are family. It's things that are related to each other because they share certain characteristics. Um, so everything is part of some, you know, some genre or, or another. And I don't think, you know, for me as a, as a writer, that's, that's a, a tremendous, um, source of, of, of story really, um, is that I, I look at the, the horror genre say, um, which is where my, you know, inclinations and talents re seem to take me again and again. Yeah. Um, and I look at that and I'm like, oh, Man, I'd like to I'd like to write about a vampire. Well, you know, and and, and like I, I can immediately start thinking to myself, so what happens in a vampire story? And I can play with that. And, and I, you know, when I when I teach this stuff or when I talk about this stuff, um, I, I tend to talk about it in relation to um, to poetic forms. That that you know, you sit down and you're like, ah, I want to write a poem. What am I going to do? Well, here's a sonnet. Do something with a sonnet. It's got certain rules are 14 lines long written right, by an yeah. amateur blah 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 and so a vampire story is is can be let's say a similar thing but then the next thing that you try to do i i think is to play with that form so oh the zombie story um yeah there are all these kind of survivalist epics right now where it's it's just uh you and me and norman reedus with our crossbows trying to hold right, more character story. study than really about the monster the monster is man type of stuff right and right exactly and and well what if we change that what if what if there's only one zombie um and and you know from so the point of view of the zombie surrounded by people or, or whatever <laughs> you know yeah. I, I mean there were there were other ways. What if the zombies are all children? What if the what if it's it's something that's happened to all our children and all our children are and how do we deal with that? Yeah. Um, or what if it's only the adults and it's the kids who you know? Um, in fact, I, I want to say that um, some years ago, Ben Peak, I think it was, wrote a zombie story that was published in a magazine. Uh, I don't think what the magazine was called. Nick Mamatas. Um, did this uh, did this one shot uh, horror magazine, and he got stories from a bunch of different people. Paul Tremblay and and um, Ben Peake was one of them. And and Ben's story, as I recall, in in Ben's story, 
the, the zombie virus only afflicts people of European descent. And oh, it's, it's from the point of view, it's from the point of view of, of an Australian, a woman who's um, of Australian Aboriginal descent. And so, I, I mean, there, there, you, you play with it then, you know, you've yeah, got yeah. that, got that structure to, to play with. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't really do much. Um, I haven't done much in, in terms of, of, I guess, um, I hate to use the term realistic fiction, but whatever we want to call it, mainstream, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but I think you do the same thing there. You know, I, I, I think that a lot of mainstream fiction um, for the last couple hundred years has concerned itself with adultery, um, whether it's The Scarlet Letter or Madame Bovary or um, Anna Karenina or pretty much everything John Updike wrote. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, all right, that's one of the things. Oh, the, adul- the adultery story. Well, what can I do with that? What is there to be... You know what is there to be done with that old chestnut? Yeah. <laughs> so I I don't see I, I don't see genre as something from a writing standpoint to be anxious about. I kind of see it as something to be embraced. I I think um, um, and I, I don't think it's something where you need to to tell another writer you can't do that. That's not in the genre. No, right, whatever. that's not in the rule book. Yeah. Right, right. Worry about yourself, man. Just, you know, just just do your own thing and and do what you, you know, do what works for you. I think the problem obviously comes that that when genre becomes used in in a kind of really a kind of politicized kind of way to say that, well, you know, um, uh, again, you know, the literary mainstream, literary realism, that's the, the that's the real thing. Um, and then you get a kind of reverse snobbery. No, no, science fiction, that's the real thing. Or, or fantasy, that's the real thing. Right, literary uh, fiction doesn't mean anything. Everything is right, genre. It, it right. Only right, because, because science fiction is about the future, you know, and, and <laughs> all anyone can agree on is they don't like horror and they don't like <laughs> romance. Those are like the two. Um, but, you know, when I, when I came back into writing, writing horror in my late 20s, I, I ran across this... Um, this quotation from Don DeLillo, who said that that he kind of liked the idea of novelists working at the kind of, like in the margins, that that he thought that that where interesting and exciting stuff really tended to happen and and really had a chance to happen was out on 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 the literary margins, that if you're in the center, if you're under the spotlight, um, you can still obviously do crazy stuff, but, but, um, if, if, I guess what the, the idea is that, that when you're under that much visibility, I don't know, maybe it produces a certain kind of pressure to, to perform in a certain way. Whereas, you know, here we are out here writing our horror novels. We can do whatever we want because, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) yeah. And, and the, you know, the ironic thing, or the interesting thing, not even ironic is, is that, man, there's so much good, crazy stuff being done right now um, that has been done, but, but I mean, it just, it is being done right now. It's hard not to think that Delillo was on to something. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess that leads us into, well, had you on so we could talk about your book, The Fisherman. Ah, uh, that. Yeah. Yes, yes, that little, that guy there. Um, right. I feel like we've burnt the, the genre uh, questions, but even still, how would you describe The Fisherman for those trying to place it um it's it's a horror novel okay. I, I i mean i think i think first and foremost it's it's uh it's a horror novel um it um and and in some ways there's probably a, a direct line <laughs> there's a direct line probably between it and um things like peter stroud's ghost story which which made a huge impression on me when, okay. when i was uh, when i was a kid um or um, and also, you know, some of Stephen King's stuff, um, especially uh, especially in the sense that, that so much of King's stuff of, his, of the, the early stuff is about Maine and, and is about that kind of sense of place and yeah, and yeah. atmosphere, yeah. history of Castle Rock, you know, and, and so that um, that Stroud gets that in, in in some of his later books and in, in uh, um, the Blue Rose trilogy, he gets that for the, the kind of Milwaukee area, which he keeps kind of reinventing. Um, yeah, but I think King was really the one who um, who did a lot with you know. For, <laughs> it was kind of a joke for a while when I was a kid that like you know it seemed like every horror novel was set in Maine, you know, and and it was because everyone had read Stephen King and they had just sort of gotten the idea that oh horror stories take place in Maine. Yeah, they all have you to know? take place in Maine. There's no other part of New England. 
Right, exactly. Right, because it wasn't that. Well, wait, just take the place you know and do something with that. You know, it was so, that Maine is the scary place. That's where yeah, people, yeah. that's where people are afraid of. I'm not sure how people from Maine feel about that. You know, <laughs> um, but yeah. So well, their so whole I, economy is based on Stephen King, right? So right. <laughs> well, it's true. You know, when I was a kid, my family um, for for several years, um, my my family would vacation in Maine. We'd take this little. Um, uh, house on the the shore of the Penobscot River, and um, one of those trips that, that we took, we did actually go to Bangor, so I could stand in front of Stephen King's house and have my picture taken there. So, um, and I, I like found those pictures a few years ago, and it was, uh, yeah, that was like my big <laughs> one of the big trips, memorable trips of my youth. You know, see, my to, grandfather to... grew up in uh, Portland, so uh, every year we'd vacation over the summer in Maine for a week at the Samoset Resort. And uh, I think maybe when I was 14, I realized there was this wall of um, celebrity photographs. I realized Stephen King had actually been to the inn that I'd been. Oh, very cool. Very yeah. Cool. And it was, it was clearly in the 80s, too, because he's in this like green uh, velour looking dress shirt with nice. a mustache and cowboy boots that were also green. Nice. So. But that was it. That was why I didn't recognize him. I've never seen Stephen King with a mustache before. Yeah, for a little while he was he he was rocking the mustache. Um, he tended to alternate between the beard and the uh, um, and clean shaven. And, and well, these uh, were the mustache years, I guess. The, the, yeah, the yeah. Lost the mustache Straub, years. Uh, for a long time, Straub was the one who had the uh, who had the mustache. Really? Because uh, I always think of him as just being kind of balding and clean shaven. Yeah, that's that's his more. Well, now he gets. I guess Straub has the the beard and the mustache too. Although it's pretty he, uh, okay. pretty close cropped. But um, but yeah, for a while when he when he released Coco, he was uh, he was doing the mustache, and maybe before then as well. Amazing. Well, I know they're he friends, so there might it might have been mustache fever, you know. It's entirely possible, right? That that uh, you know King was like, look, man, or vice versa. Or vice you know? versa, it, yeah, it, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, far be it from me. But I'm yeah, so, so I, I but mean, yeah, the fisherman. <laughs> yeah, no, those guys, and I have a beard and mustache too. Um, so, so those guys are really, you know, their, um, their. I, I think their presence is kind of loom large behind the behind the fisherman. Okay. Um, the book also, I mean, it, it started out in a lot of ways um, as me playing. I don't know how to d- describe it exactly, but but kind of riffing on Moby Dick. Um, All right. When I it was. When I started writing The Fisherman, um, I thought that, that what I would do is I would write this. I thought it would probably be a novella, but but this shorter piece. Yeah. And my idea was to take Moby Dick as, as um, again, King has talked about doing this with Dracula when he wrote Salem's Lot, the, that he's described Dracula as this um, kind of wall that he was like sort of smacking a handball against and seeing, you know, how it came back to him. Um, what angle his ideas bounced off Dracula at. And so I, I guess I had the same idea with uh, with Moby Dick, which right. which is a book I love, but that I also um, I, I recognize that, that it, it's, it's like it's like a lot of Henry James' stuff. I love it, but if somebody says to me, oh, I can't stand that book, I'm like, that's totally fine. I don't I don't judge you because it, it is a difficult book and, you know, yeah, more yeah. about whales than you could ever want to know. But, but the central idea of... Um, of Moby Dick, as, as I see it, you know, which is Ahab, at, at one point says the world is a is a, a pasteboard mask, and if you could punch through that mask, you could see what lies behind. Would you know? And, and of course, that's the question: Would you see the face of God, yeah, or yeah. would you see nothing? Or, or, and so that that idea I found really um, useful for for thinking about. Um, but the beginning, so, so you know, Moby Dick begins, call me Ishmael. My novel begins, don't call me Abraham. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, this will, um, if, if you've read Moby Dick, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll hear, oh, he's doing something. So it's, it's uh, you know, I wanted to, to be maybe too clever for my own good, but to simultaneously, you know, sort of invoke Melville, but also say, but this isn't exactly Melville. So it's, it's uh, so there were a number of points throughout. So the, the working title was not quite Melville? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sounds like a sitcom. Moby Dick actually. Light. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, yeah, the the um, I don't know what the gray whale, I guess, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. You know? And uh, and yeah, just um, 
it it went it went from there. So it, it kind of brings together um, that kind of strain of American literature, um, and then also, I, you know, I, I mean, it obviously, um, the funny thing, I, I mean, is that Melville, in his own way, I would argue, you know, he participates in kind of the Gothic tradition um, more so maybe in things like Bartleby the Scrivener or Pierre than he does in Moby Dick, but there's still some Gothic stuff in there. Um, so it kind of brings him together with the later Gothic people like King and Straub and to, uh, All right. uh, into my own uh, particular version of events. How long did it take you to finish the first draft? Um, somewhere like Give or take. Eight, like, like 12 or 13 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so not too I mean, long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It was only the, like a decade or so. It's fine. The um, the, to to try and make things as 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 simple as possible. When I started publishing, um, professionally, I was trying to publish a story a year. Okay. Um, yeah. I was I was working on my PhD at the time, um, and I happened to write this story that I thought I could publish. Actually, for one of my graduate classes, I published that story. Um, and uh, and this was, I mean, I, I should note this is at this point I I was like, um, I was in my early thirties. I had spent my twenties writing. I, I had written a, a very long novel, a shorter novel, and a bunch of novellas, none of which will ever see the light of day. Um, right. I mean, I think a lot of writers are like that. They work on some stuff and go, okay, yeah, let's burn that or let's keep that in the drawer until I die. Well, it was, you know, it was, it, it was exercise, I, I guess, or something like that. You know, it was, it was learning how to, how to write. Um, but it was, all of that stuff was me trying to write, um, I guess, more mainstream kind of stuff. But, but I, I, I realize now when I look back on it that the kind of emotional terrain that I was covering was, was always horror, was, was always, you know, in a, this sort of horrific direction. So when I finally came back to writing horror fiction, everything clicked. But um, but like getting published, in some ways, I guess it, it um, almost freaked me out a little bit, I suppose. And I thought, oh, man, you know, I want to get published again. <laughs> I want to right, do this that's again, the goal. But, is, let's see if I, I can do this able, a couple more times. Yeah, am I going to be able to do this um, – uh, or, or how soon am I going to be able to, you know, all these anxieties, right? And so I decided to myself, when I sold my first story, I knew that I had, I found out I had a year till it was going to come out. And I thought, okay, so that gives me a whole year to write the second story. And if I can get that accepted <laughs> before yeah, yeah. the first story comes out, it'll be cool. So I did that, and I did the same thing with the third story. And then um, after the third story, uh, after the third story was accepted, um, my wife, uh, you know, my, my wife and I were expecting our, uh, our son and I was like, oh man, well, I better write something before the baby's born because <laughs> right, you're not going to have a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. I could just imagine there was not going to be much time. So I, I started on the, like I said, this, this story that was going to become the fisherman. Um, and I got pretty far into it and, um, I realized, oh man, this is turning into a novel and, which was, I was like, oh, I'm not, I can't write a novel. <laughs> so um, instead I put it aside, and, and I was like, okay, you know what, I'm going to put that aside. Um, I've got this idea for another story. I'm going to write that. Um, and then yeah, ironically, yeah. That, that became my first novel, House of Windows. Um, so you put aside the novel and then ended up writing a novel. Right, right. And, and you know, the, the ironic thing in some ways is that the novel that I, I wrote, House of Windows, there were ways in which it should have been my second novel because unlike the fisherman, the, the narrator of, of house of windows was much more uh, and deliberately, you know, sort of unlikable. Um, I, I really wanted to write this character who was complicated and, and wasn't necessarily, I hoped you would empathize with the character eventually, but I also wanted the character to be sort of unlikable at times. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the kind of thing that, you know, you read the second novel, oh, look at the writer, look at how he's stretching his wings and all this kind of stuff. But <laughs> yeah. um, but for a first novel, it was kind of a disaster. Um, I mean, the, the book did okay, and, and it's continued. Every now and again, someone sends me an email and says, hey, I found this book, I really liked it. Um, but in the meantime, I would go back to The Fisherman every now and again and, and add a little bit more to it. And, you know, I, I have to give my agent credit. Um 
uh, the the uh, the fabulous Ginger Clark of uh, of Curtis Brown, because every now and again she would send me an email. Uh, hey, just you know, what's going on? Just wanted uh, wondering if you're if uh, you know you're thinking about the fisherman. You want to do anything with it? And she would say, no pressure. You don't have to do anything. If if you've moved past it, that's fine. But then she would say, but look, if you know what happens, I just want to know. <laughs> if you don't. So uh, a few years ago, I don't know, two or three years ago, I guess at this point. I decided, all right, I'm just going to put this thing to bed. I'm just going to get to get done with this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and then once I did, that took you know it probably took about six months to to finish the thing. Um, and um, so and that's, I polished. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean the the uh, you know the, once the thing, um, you know w- once I just committed to the thing, it, it was. Um, it was not that bad getting it getting it done, and and I um, sent it to my agent. She was happy with it, um, and you know, ironically, um, this novel ran into the same uh, you know issues, if you will, that um, that House of Windows ran into. You know, we sent it to all the big houses, and the ones who were focused on horror were like, "Well, well we, you know, this is cool horror stuff, man, but what's all this literary character?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that and all the literary ones. That's all like, this well, characterization, yeah. Right. I mean, it was like the you know Reese's peanut butter cup, and um, and so finally, yeah, I, I lucked into um, um, to Ross at at, at Word Horde. You know, I actually kind of I was feeling kind of kind of low about the book, and I uh, I sent him uh, a copy just to read. You know, yeah, just yeah. I wasn't like it wasn't like. Um, I wasn't like looking for a back. Uh, 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 I wasn't looking surreptitiously to be published, right. uh, or I just wanted someone's opinion I could trust. And and you know Ross, um, when I had uh, my my House of Windows was published through Nightshade Press, and Ross had been far and away the best thing about about working with Nightshade. Um, he was always uh, responsive. He was always he was just on top of everything. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I, um, I just thought, okay, Ross will give me a, an honest opinion of this. And, yeah. and you know, right away he was like, all right, I, I want to take this book and let's. So it took us a little bit longer to, to get things, uh, to get things figured out. But once we did, you know, here we are. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, it's, uh, I've, I've really. Well, it's been uh, a long road, but congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and, and look, I, I mean, Man, as the song says, it's a long way to the top, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, uh, um, it is, uh, I think it was Elvis Costello who said it takes you over uh, uh, 18 years to become an overnight sensation or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, Overnight success. I think that's always funny because you know, to everyone else, yeah. it isn't overnight. And to the person, it's like, no, this has been like a decade or more. This has been 20 years, you know? Yeah, no, I, I mean, look, man, I, I wrote my first... Um, what I think of as my first horror story back in, in, well, maybe first grade even. I was thinking fifth grade. But, you know, the first thing I, I made any money off, I was a freshman in high school and I won the Christmas writing contest for well, a story of yeah. horrible things happening. Um, so, you know, I was, I was 13. Um, no, I was probably 14 at that point. And um, here I am, I'm 46. I'll be, I'll be 47 next month. So... Um, it's it's not it's not that there's been a long desert <laughs> yeah. because because you know plenty of things have happened and I'm grateful for everything that's happened, but just um, the wheels of publishing can grind slowly and then they can grind incredibly quickly. You know, it, it uh, you make the you find the the publisher who who wants to do something with uh, with you. Then suddenly you're like, oh hey, here's my book. By the way, have a look. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. So that's I, I mean that's the the. I, w- I would say the short version of the story, but God knows that's <laughs> <laughs> not short. Well, I've interviewed you before. I'm used to it. Yeah, yeah. You're, well, you're true actually enough. a dream interview because I don't have to do much. I just lob a, a short one at you, and I'll get a, a 20 minute right. response. <laughs> you're just like, tell me about Frankenstein, and I'm like, Frankenstein, hold on. And yeah. then I go get a beer and I check my mail, and yeah, <laughs> right. And I'm still talking, you know. And then in Peter Cushing's version, yeah. <laughs> um, so. Who are some authors lately that you've been reading that you think deserve some praise? Oh man, there's so many. I mean, there's a bajillion, so that's a tough one. But the um, um, 
I've been doing a little bit of reviewing for uh, Locus. Um, I've been uh, uh, reviewing a couple of horror books and collections for them, you know, with each issue. Yeah. Uh, the last couple of issues, and it looks like I'll continue. Um, so that's actually there's uh, there are a number of things I've I've reviewed quite recently. Um, uh, Gemma Files novel, uh, experimental film. I've heard really great things about that. Actually, that is a messed up novel, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I say that in the way that you know. I don't know. Horror fans say that to one another. Oh, that's really messed up, man. But you know, it's like it's like high a, praise. A good messed up, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. It's it's right. It's not like oh, the font is terrible. I couldn't read it. You know, yeah. it's, 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 punctuation. The is formatting atrocious. is terrible. It's quite yeah. messed up. <laughs> Who was responsible for copy editing this? No, it's it's um, you know, Gemma's really had this. Um, I don't know what to call it, mid-career resurgence or something like that. You know, her first couple of collections came out in the late 90s, I think it was, um, Kissing Carrion and The Worm in Every Heart. And um, they've actually just been they've been reprinted, I think, in um, maybe an electronic edition by uh, Cheezine or, or uh, Chizine. All right. Um, and it was uh, – but, you know, in, in more recent years – She's done the Hexlinger trilogy. Um, she's done um, a, a book called "We Will All Go Down Together," which is a, a collection of, of sort of braided stories. Um, and then this novel, experimental film, which is is just um, this great, great book that that mixes together um, the story of a, um, a woman who lived about a hundred years ago, who was making films. Um, on, on um, a kind of film stock uh, called Silver Nitrate, which is apparently very dangerous. And this is all for real, you know. This oh, whole, oh that, all right. Like, well, I mean, the woman wasn't real, but Silver Nitrate was real. Um, and uh, so she was making these movies, and then the movies get discovered about a hundred years later. And the and the, the narrator of the novel is is this woman who's a film critic, um, but who's also dealing with. Uh, um, she has a son um, who's uh, who's on the autism um, spectrum, spectrum yeah. and she's struggling to to raise him along with her with her husband. But she's involved in the in the the discovery of this lost film, and it, it could really make her career. It could really give her um, tremendous you know status and standing in that. But um, the films are are we we find out are connected to to some. Um, some pretty fearsome, um, what would you call them, um, a minor goddess, but a really frightening minor goddess uh, yeah. from from, uh, from Middle Europe. And uh, yeah, I, I just thought uh, I just thought Gemma really uh, really just hit it right out of the park with uh, with that one. Um, I would also, um, you know, I, I uh, would give a shout out to a fellow uh, word horde author, uh, Olivia Llewellyn. Uh, oh her, yeah, her Furnace her was like, incredible. Story. Yeah, Furnace is is it's so good. Um, her her grasp, you know, her her ability. Uh, I don't even know what to call it with language. You know that that her style is just so amazing, and she's able to. I think one of the things I admire about her is is that she's able to take these these concepts that if you were to hear them described, um, you know, here's a story about Mina Harker. Um, it's set at the end of Dracula when she and Van Helsing are going off in search of, of Dracula's brides. And um, the, three, the three brides, Dracula's three brides, all kind of like psychically visit her through the night. And you would think, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she makes this amazing story out of that. Um, and then she has a, a, um, a later story in that. You know, a lot of Livia's writing is, is, a lot of her, stylistically speaking, is extremely Baroque. Um, very dense, uh, very poetic. Yeah. But then she has a, a late story in the collection. I think it's called The Last Clean Bright Summer, which is from the point of view of, uh, of an adolescent girl, and it's, it's written in this pitch-perfect um, approximation of an adolescent girl's diary. And she and her family, they're going on the family vacation. Oh, my God, what could be worse? You know, <laughs> They're going yeah, to the yeah. seashore. And yet, as you read the, the story... You realize that there's this is not quite the same world that we live in now. It's the United States, but it, but things have changed. Things have gotten different, and there's just this this stupefying conclusion to it. Um, so yeah, so I would I would absolutely um, I would give her a, a, a big shout out as well. Um, 
Damien uh, Damien Angelica Walters, uh, her first novel, Paper Tigers. Um, I uh, I got to read that, and um, it's very it's a very fine novel. It's it's very um, it's very focused. It's about a woman who's um, been in a horrible fire, and uh, she's been horribly injured on one side of her body. Mm. She's kind of retreated from the world. The the her injury obviously has cost her physically, but it's also cost her her interaction with the rest of the world, um, up to and including her fiancé who left her when he saw how injured she was. And uh, she discovers a scrapbook of, of uh, pictures uh, of an old house, and uh, gradually she becomes drawn into the scrapbook, quite literally. Um, and oh. I, I thought that it was, um, um, you know, it, it was it's, it's this... The, the control in 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 what uh, in, in what Damien does there the the her the, the focus of the novel is is so intense um, and uh, more recently I'm I'm um, I'm reading Matthew Bartlett's uh, new collection uh, Creeping uh, Waves like Creeping Waves which yeah, yeah. Uh, you know I, Bartlett's um, the the first collection uh, Gateways to Abomination I, I just I just blew me away I just I just thought man you know this because when you when you get the book at first, right? When you and I think the same thing is even more more true of, of Creeping Ways. But you get the book and you, you you thumb through it, and you think, oh, all right, so this is some kind of like horror flash fiction. Or yeah, something. yeah. And then what you realize as you read the book is that the pieces are all talking to one another, and that in a lot of cases, what you're getting is is you're getting this narrative that's been broken up over over several different stories, and that you're even seeing different parts of in, in still other stories. And so it's this weird kind of mosaic effect. And uh, yeah, I I, um, I think what I think what Bartlett's doing is is tremendous. And and uh, all of these all of these writers, man. I mean, and like I say, they're just the they're the tip of the the tip of the iceberg, you know. Um, I'm looking forward. I haven't I haven't gotten a copy of it yet, but I'm looking forward to Richard Gavin's new collection. Oh yeah. Uh, obviously, Laird Barron has a new collection coming out. Um, Does he? I've read. Uh, uh, I mean, Paul. yeah, I know he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, I've read Paul Tremblay's new novel, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, which is a heartbreaker of a novel. It's. Uh, um, it's such a great follow-up to, to Head Full of Ghosts, which was, of course, itself a tremendous novel. Right. Yeah. This one, uh, this one goes in, in different directions, but it, there's still this really tight focus on a, on a family and, and on their on their I don't know their, their challenges, their difficulties, and, and really, um, you know, Tremblay's really good at adolescence. He's he's very very good at, at portraying sort of adolescent psychology, and um, I, I think he just he nails it again in in this one. Um, he's he's uh, he's two for two uh, as far as these recent books go. Yeah, I mean there are, there are far too many existing good authors, new authors coming out every day that are amazing. There's there's we are in a a sea of wonderful fiction. Yeah, I I just. Um... I can't keep up with all of it, you know, which oh, is a good problem. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I, I just, um, um, there's so, there, there's so much out there that, uh, that, that when I hear about somebody else, you know, um, Christopher Buhlman, for example, um, I had read his vampire novel, The Lesser Dead. Uh, I think it was nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award last year or the year before, which is this terrific novel about um, vampires living in the subways of New York. It's set in the 1970s. Yeah. And um, and now I got a copy of his new novel, The Suicide uh, The Suicide Motor Club, which is about vampires, um, a sort of squad of vampires driving two cars back and forth across country um, in the U.S. in the in the um, the 60s, the late 60s. There's sort of overtones of the Manson family, uh, among other things in it. Oh. And Buhlman's an amazing writer, and, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy has like you know, four or five other books. I've really got to check him out because right. yeah. he writes these novels that that just move it at at full speed, but which are beautifully written. Um, oh, and Michael Sisko's new novel. You know, speaking of Sisko and going going back to the weird, um, the Wretch of the Sun. Um, I read that. I just finished that, and um, you know, Cisco is just unlike any of the rest of us. <laughs> Um, yeah. it, you know, his his novel tries to to sort of place in conjunction um, a haunted house 
and the notion of haunting and the notion of a ghost haunting a house um, and secret police and, and the way that secret police work in a security state. Huh. And it's the most, in some ways, like the most bizarre juxtaposition, you know? It does. Um, when you say it, it seems odd, but I, I can picture him writing it and it working. Well, you know, that, that's, that's the thing, because what Cisco does is Cisco says, hey, so the way a haunted house, for a haunted house to be known as a haunted house, you have to, like, like the secret of the ghost has to get out. You right, have to yeah. know there's something in there. And for secret police to really be effective, you have to know about them. They can't be, if they're, if they're completely secret, then they lose something of their power, you know, to terrify you. Right. But if you know that there's this secret police lurking. So, so he, he brings together, Cisco brings together the, um, you know, the kind of gothic and the political um, in, this, in this really interesting kind of way. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, I, I swear, Stephen Graham Jones, Mongrels, right? I, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful book. I just actually interviewed him for Miskatonic Musings. Yeah, he's, he's, I hate that guy. You know, I mean, <laughs> he's such a nice guy. And, he's a and really he's, nice guy, and he's oh, got roughly 500 novels. So, yeah, and he's so talented. And, and, you know, his, um, his work, there, there's a, a kind of a purity and, and, and a kind of, uh, a deep melancholy to his work that that just uh, that just tears my heart out, you know. And and um, uh, at mongrels, it, it seems to me just this um, this. It's obviously it's a terrific werewolf novel, you know. But yeah. it 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 does so many different things, and it does them all in in you know what's actually a relatively short novel, right? I, yeah, I mean, yeah. you kind of feel like for as as um, as much as he does in that novel, it could have been two or th- it could have been like one of those eighty style, you know, door stoppers. Um, right. Yeah. Um, but could have but been no. a Stephen King special. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You know. And and, and uh, yeah. He's he's uh, he's. I, I can't wait to see what he what he does next. I don't know if he's going to write a sequel to it or or if he's going to do something else. You know. And and um, wh- whatever he does, I can't wait. I mean, I still got some of his. Uh, older novels to to get through, so that's good in the in the meantime because there's so much of it. But... Right, and he's another one like Kelly Link, where I feel like it's across the board. He can write anything he wants to. Yeah, and he does. You know, he he really he's talked about that, uh, and I think this is when you think about the way that genre can function in a good way for a writer is that that he'll say that I I. I, I read something one of the interviews he did it must have been for mongrels he was talking about um i think wanting to figure out how to write a romance story that he still felt he hadn't quite figured that one out yet and so for him these are kind of technical challenges Uh, and as a writer again i I think about it as like a poet who's like well i've never really written a good sestina i've got to work out that form He's like, oh, okay. How do I work out? How do I do the 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 romance story then? What's a good way to make that work? Yeah. And I think it shows up in some of his, um, I think in his novel, Growing Up Dead in Texas. There's a, there's a little bit of the romance thing going on, but but not not a lot. Right. Yeah. Now, um, what about you? You've, what about you? You've got a book coming out, don't you? What's up with that? Oh well, uh, it's a chat book, and I actually started it in. <laughs> I started it in 2014 compiling the stories because I've been I've been writing for the last decade give or take um, and I basically just took all of the stories I thought were even remotely good and kind of you know figured out which order to put them in and then I kind of sat on it and would stare at it and work on other projects try and shop other short stories um, but I, I kept going back to it and not really knowing I wasn't really sure how to do it it seemed a little long, and there were stories I weren't happy with. I, I weren't. I wasn't happy with. It's all right. Um, you're from Maine. I know. I'm from Maine. Yeah. Um. So weren't happy with some stories. Uh. No. But so I finally I started reading more chat books, and I realized, wait, this is a perfectly valid way to do it, and it, I like the how it's it's condensed nature uh, lends itself to a one sitting read. And yep. I thought, well, what if I just took out the stories I'm not happy with, and then I got a chat book? So mm-hmm. that's what I have now. And uh, it should be coming out this summer. Excellent. Uh, f- Who's doing that? Five stories. Uh, yep. McMahon Beast Books, which is me. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. 
Yeah. And will there be uh, will there be like uh, I don't know? Can you get it on the internet or or? Oh, it's gonna the first. Um, and it's funny because uh, since I'm the publisher, it's all the stuff I say. It's just me making it up on the spot. Uh, <laughs> no. Of course, um, right. No. Um, initially, I'm gonna have it as an ebook which I'm planning on hopefully releasing by at least at the latest, the beginning of August. Okay. And then I'm going to be working on a uh, bonus novelette for the physical copy. Cause I'd feel like a okay. schmuck charging, you know, six bucks for a 30 page <laughs> physical right. book. But yeah, that that's, that's my stuff. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So I, there's, I, I mean, all over the place, man, you know, it's, it's, uh, Honestly, yeah, it's it's a good. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's it's a good time to be to be alive and writing and reading this stuff. There's, there's it is so a good much. time. There's a lot more options than ever before. There's there's a lot of good fiction all across the board. And what I am really excited about is it seems like more and more there are genre mashups or people that are throwing aside the old um, rules for lack of a better term of what uh -huh. you can and can't do within a certain genre and mixing and blending and making wonderful concoctions in the process. Yeah. It's, it's important. You know, um, I got to think back to my literary critical who's a, what's a thing. I mean, this was a point, um, I'm going to say Samuel Delaney made it, um, some years ago that, that genre. And I think he was, sort of in response to fans who who want to be able to say, well, you know, that's not really science fiction or that's not really fantasy or that's not really horror. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, but his his kind of point was that genre is by its very nature impure. The, the, the genre is always a mix of, 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 other, of elements from other genres. You know, it's, it's a, a, from its own history. Um, you know, and, and the things that we kind of take for granted we we look at them and and from the perspective of history and and we say ah you know but that's lovecraft or whatever right um but i think like like um uh, ramsey campbell or someone pointed out that that you know say like when lovecraft is writing his horror stories especially the great horror stories call it cthulhu and all that that, yeah, that yeah. every one of his horror stories is an experiment in how you can write a horror story Suppose I did it this way. Suppose I did it that way. And a lot of people tend to lose that because they, they, they look at Lovecraft's language, which tends to be the same in every story, although right. even there's some variation. But, and they miss the fact that, that in, in each story, structurally speaking, he's trying out a different way to do it. And King has done this. Um, Straub has done this. Campbell himself has, has done this. Um, and, and so I think that... Um, Every genre, if, if it's going to continue, um, if it's going to if it's going to keep on keeping on, every genre has to to change that way, has to has to develop, has to bring in new stuff into itself. Sometimes sometimes that can mean going back, you know, reaching back to um, to what you you know the, the the roots of the genre. Yeah. But I think even if you're going back to um, something like the castle of otranto or something you know that's the first gothic novel which is a terrible book <laughs> um but but nonetheless like <sighs> borges makes this point he's, he's got this story um pierre menard author of the quixote about this guy who rewrites uh don quixote word for word uh, now he doesn't plagiarize it he just kind of comes up with it right okay. it word for word. but borges point is is that the exact same sentences written in two different time periods mean completely different things, you know, or wildly different things, maybe not completely different. Yeah. And so you can go back to the castle of Otranto about a guy who's being killed by his family members are being killed by giant pieces of a suit of armor or pieces of a giant suit of armor. You can go back to that and bring that forward into 2016. And it, again, it's going to mean something completely different to us than it did when when Walpole was was writing it in the in the late eighteenth century. So Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's there should always be room to, to try new stuff. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Um well it's getting around the hour mark, so if you're good, I'm good. Okay. All right. I'm yeah. a, well, 
Um, well, okay. Well, before we go, I'd like to mention that The Fisherman is out officially June 30th. So whenever this gets put up, hopefully before June 30th, but you never know. So, yeah, go pick up The Fisherman uh, out from Word Horde. And uh, thanks uh, for talking with me, John. Um, is there anything else you want to add before we sign no, I, off? No, I just want to say thanks very much for having me on, man. I, I really appreciate the chance to uh, to chat, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate the you know the time that people that people give to both of us to listen to to these kinds of things. And and well, I love doing these. Them. I wouldn't do this stuff if I didn't love doing it. Yeah, they should keep an eye out for your book, and uh, you know, it sounds like <laughs> later on in the in the summer. And um, and hey, any of the other books that we've mentioned um, over the course of this hour, you know, if you're looking for uh, for good stuff to read, start with any one of these, and uh, and I'm sure you'll find something you like. Well, thanks a lot for coming on again. Uh, this has thanks. been Sean M. Thompson talking with John Langan. Uh, go buy Word Horde books, everybody.